Hello and welcome back to the WCW Review Series where we focus on everything WCW. Right now, we're in Asheville, North Carolina, September 17th, 1995 for WCW Presents Fall Brawl War Games. This, the War Games match, the main event would pit Team Hulkamania minus Vader but add Lex Luger into it as we covered on the previous two episodes. Then, then... The Dungeon of Doom on the other side of Team Hulkamania wins. Hulk Hogan, of course, gets five minutes alone in the cage with Kevin Sullivan. Still, we have Arn Anderson colliding with Ric Flair. We're in North Carolina, Horseman Country. We have the tag team titles on the line with the challengers, the Harlem Heat, facing Bunkhouse Buck, Dirty Dick Slater. Also, the TV title will be on the line, defended by the Renegade versus Diamond Dallas Page. And don't forget... U.S. Heavyweight title qualifying match, Flying Brian Pillman versus Johnny B. Bad. What are we waiting for, ladies and gentlemen? Let's get into the action. W War Games Fall Brawl 1995, ladies and gentlemen. As I said before, we are live emanating from the Asheville Civic Center, Asheville, North Carolina. 6,600 people in attendance that day. Our commentators, ladies and gentlemen, our commentators are Tony Schiavone, Bobby the Brain Heenan. As they go over the action for the night, we'll start out with a U.S. heavyweight title qualifying match, Flying Brian Pillman versus Johnny B. Bad. We have Cobra versus Sergeant Craig Pittman, DDP versus the Renegade for the TV title, the tag team titles on the line, Arn versus Flair, and the War Games match. And lest we not forget, our ring announcer for the evening, Mr. Michael Buffer. Here we go, fans. The opening contest from Asheville, the Asheville Civic Center, as I stated earlier. This match is for the number one contendership to Sting's U.S. heavyweight title, making his way to the ring first. Flying Brian Pillman, who has been acting very heelish, after that opening match on Nitro against Yushin Thunder Liger, kind of reverted back to some heel tactics, which would we would see develop more and more. His opponent, of course, is Johnny B. Bad, a.k.a. Mark Marrow, Mr. Sable. Uh, his gimmick was very over with WCW at this point. And, you know, some of the wrestling and gimmicks and promos were very difficult to get through at this time in 95 uh, in WCW as well as WWE because of the cartoonish nature of some of them. And, yeah, I forgot we have Michael Buffer announcing them in the ring. Johnny B. Bad firing off the confetti gun into the crowd. There we see the nameplates, Brian Pillman and Johnny B. Bad getting ready to go to war here. This match for an opening contest on a pay-per-view could have been a main event on any other card. Uh, it starts out with, you know, Merrill working bad into the corner. We get a clean break. Uh, Pillman extends the hand, and, you know, Merrill's like, oh, you know, the, the typical heel. The, All right, you know, we'll shake hands on it. And we go into another lockup. Nice little arm drag takeover. Uh, reverse waist lock by Pillman as Merrill tries to break the hold. And then we start out with a reversal. And this is a nice work out of that with a flip arm drag into a side headlock by Pillman as he takes control and most of this match would go back and forth here this was a nice spot the missed drop kick as you can see Merrow and Pillman very evenly matched in terms of athleticism in this contest uh, Pillman working the arm Merrow flips out reverses it goes back to that top hand wrist lock on Pillman as he's on his knees and Pillman work out of this with a beautiful reversal into the side headlock takeover to regain control Pillman showing us his war face right there and Merrill works his way back. Irish whip. Beautiful head scissor takeover into a roll-up pin attempt by Pillman. Back to the headlock. And these two worked uh, very well together in terms of, you know, mixing in rest holds with a nice, uh, you know, not necessarily a, a huge high-flying spot, but they really worked the rest holds and then went to, like, a bigger spot to advance the story in the match. And that's what you get. Uh, this uh, Boston Crab attempt here, very low. Uh, not much pressure on the back, uh, but we see Pillman set up. You know what time it is? Oh. Pillman with some choppy choppy. Then a beautiful Irish whip reverse backbreaker. Merrill steps on top to start working the ankle. And 
He works this into a nice surfboard stretch here. A lot of submission holds applied in this match. Uh, Pillman and Mero get into a little bit of shoving in the middle of the ring. And Pillman, you can see, he goes with a back elbow after he worked Mero into the corner. And, of course, another choppy choppy. Mero, though, comes back with fists. Pillman powders. Mero measures him up. Pillman walked up the aisleway. Like, you know, good heel move there. But, uh, you know, Mero not shaking hands this time around after Pillman gets back in the ring. Pillman quickly regains the advantage. Goes with a clubbing blow to the back, which is where he Tosses Mero out of the ring again as Pillman gets Mero back up on the apron. Hit him with the turnbuckle. Mero blocks it. Pillman eats it. Takes a leg drop. Two count no. Back into a uh, chin lock by Mero. And this, like I said, great back and forth here. Double drop kick. Knocks both of them down. Pillman with the big headbutt taking Mero down. Mero kicked to the outside of the ring. Pillman sets up to suplex Mero back into the ring as we see the look on Nick Patrick's face. Mero, of course, reverses it, or Johnny B. Bad, I should say. Pillman eats it to the outside. As he turns around, he doesn't see Mark Mero lining up a flipping attack off the ropes. High cross body to the outside, and Pillman tossed back into the ring by Mero. Mero wants to go up to the high rent district, lines it up at Pillman. You can tell he's getting cocked, locked, ready to rock. Intercepts Mero with a drop kick right to the mush, and Pillman... Goes for another Irish whip attack here on Johnny B. Bad. But Bad reverses it. Sit out powerbomb. Two count. No. And like I said, a lot of great back and forth. Uh, the pacing of this match really helped with the storytelling as we get another reverse Irish whip here and into a tombstone that would have ended in a two count. They used a lot of finishers in this match. Uh, I think if it was anybody else but Brian Pillman and Mark Marrow, you know, the boys might have had a problem with some of this. Uh, a lot of the finishers being used you know, prematurely in the first match of the night. But like I said, they balanced it out. There wasn't a ton of like, you know, suicide, like high spots. We got some dives to the outside that looked a little bit risky. Uh, some nice aerials inside the ring. Here's a pinning attempt by Pillman. Merrill kicks out again. Nick Patrick with the two count. And this, ladies and gentlemen, leads us to the end of regulation time and Nick Patrick goes to Michael Buffer, who then announces to the crowd that we're going to restart the match. It's overtime here. Pillman and <laughs> Johnny B. Bad square off again. They go to the outside automatically, and this gets the advantage towards Pillman as he, you know, takes a couple blows, but then Irish whip reverse. Mero eats the guardrail. Pillman tosses him back inside the ring. And we go right back to the in-ring action. Pillman up top. Marrow and him both miss the double drop kick. And we get another double down. This works into a sleeper hold by Pillman. We'd see a couple rest holds, chin locks here. And this exchange, Pillman gets Marrow ready, takes him up top. But, ladies and gentlemen, Marrow tosses Pillman down. Sunset flip into a two count. Marrow sizes it up, sets up for the power bomb, which... Pillman would, of course, reverse into a Hurricane Rana. Two count, no. Pillman is frustrated. He's beside himself. Everything he's tried can't put Mero away. Mero again lines up an Irish whip. Pillman goes into a crucifix, which has led to a backdrop by Mero and another two count. Pillman back up top. Mero says, that's enough. We're done here. Hurricane Rana off the top. And no, again, Pillman kicks out. Neither one of these warriors can put the other one away. Mero takes Pillman back to the other side of the ring. Puts him up top again. Pillman, though, makes, uh, <laughs> makes Johnny B. Bad eat a fist into a DDT. Two count, no. Nothing. Can't put him away. Everything in the arsenal. The gas tanks are getting empty here. Pillman says, that's it. It's over. It's done. I'm going upstairs. Last time, Pillman upstairs gets crotched on the ropes by Mero. <laughs> and we're still going here, ladies and gentlemen. Tosses Pillman to the outside. Eats the guardrail in a nasty spot. Pillman's thinking, what have I done? Ladies and gentlemen, this would not be the worst of it for Brian Pillman in his career. Merrill Sunset flipped to the outside. He says, here we go. Lines it up. He's going to hit him with the high cross body inside. Body splash. And gets up. Pillman gets the knees up the last minute. Merrill back outside the ring again. This is going to lead to a spot where Pillman didn't really get all of this. He landed a little short. Mero worked his best to catch Pillman, though. We get back inside the ring, go to the turnbuckle. 
Pillman crotches himself on the ropes again. He's going for the drop kick. Merrill ducks out of the way. We get a little cross-up spot here off the Irish whip, leading into a high cross body. Merrill gets the one, two, three, and finally wins the match, becomes the number one contender for Sting's U.S. heavyweight title. Here is the winner of your opening contest, Johnny B. Bad. Back to the broadcast position as Heenan and Shivani discuss what they just saw in Pillman versus Johnny B. Bad. They set up for the upcoming match with Cobra versus Pittman and then discuss in great detail the four horsemen colliding in Arn Anderson versus the nature boy Ric Flair. And in a parting note, Bobby Heenan has some words for a fan who said something that he didn't particularly care for. But right now we hey, go to same to you, kid. Toss backstage to Mean Gene Okerlund, who is joined by the Nature Boy Ric Flair, who will later on tonight be meeting his running mate in the Four Horsemen, Arn Anderson. The symbol of excellence. Flair lets everybody know who he is and what the Horsemen represent. And there's only one king in the hill. And that sets up for the match later on. The explosion between the friends, the brothers, Ric Flair, and Arn Anderson later on tonight at Fall Brawl. Next up is the match between two fictional soldiers who have a grudge that started off camera with a bunch of stuff that we'll never see but only hear about. Uh, Cobra and Craig Pittman. Cobra is the heel in this match. and You see he gives his dog tags to a young man in the front row. Not a very heel thing to do, but I appreciate it. And he makes his way into the ring. Cobra, of course, is Jeff Farmer. We see Pittman's music and screen light up, but uh, who, no, no Pittman through the pyro. Uh, we look back as the smoke clears and still nothing. And out comes... And then out comes... I, I don't... Who was it? We don't know. We don't know who this guy is. Cobra looks confused. He's standing in the ring awaiting this guy's you know arrival. And he walks up on the ring and they face to face cobra demands where's pitman where's pitman well oh my god it's sting no it's not sting it's pitman sting would do that later it's not owen hart either and cobra gets you know his back's turned pitman gets in the ring belly crawls all the way across the ring takes the belt chokes cobra out with it uh, a bunch of punches uh punches and you know there's kicks and he throws Cobra out, he eats shit, and goes out on the floor, and more punches, more punches, Pittman gets posted, Cobra goes up top, he's going to hit him with a high-flying maneuver, a high-flying maneuver, and he takes off, and he eats shit, and this means only one thing, thank God this match is over with already, as Pittman hits the code red, and Cobra taps out immediately, that's it, Pittman refuses to break the hold, referee Randy Anderson admonishing him, he finally breaks it, raises his hand, we don't need no stinking hand raise, here's your winner, Craig the Pitbull, Pittman, thank God it's over. Back to the broadcast position with Shivani and Heenan as they discuss Mr. Wonderful, and Bobby laments that Mr. Wonderful has not been himself as of late, he's been on a losing streak ever since a loss to Macho man we go back to his locker room which is now just for paul orndorff and not mr wonderful as it were and we see him in this weird promo losing his mind throwing stuff all over his dressing room you know he's he's kind of at his wits end he doesn't know what to do anymore and then he hears a knock at his door and who who could this be gary spivey mr wonderful they let me back here to see you of the Psychic Companions Network. I don't remember Gary Spivey. I don't particularly remember this promo. I don't think this ever went anywhere with this weird uh, Chia Pet looking white guy in an afro and a Bee Gees outfit. But Wonderful makes his case to him. And Spivey says, you just have to believe and be Mr. Wonderful. Because you are Mr. Wonderful. I am Mr. Wonderful. I am Mr. Wonderful. I am Mr. Wonderful. That's great. Thank you, Gary. Heenan says he knows Orndorff and he's going to change everything around. Now let's go. Now let's go to the ring for our TV title match between Diamond Dallas Page and the Renegade, the current TV champion. Next up on the card is the world television title match between the challenger Diamond Dallas Page, who's accompanied to the ring by the Diamond Dial and Max Muscle. DDP was still a heel at this time, and he was always very rude to the Diamond Dial. You can see him here, you know, forcing her to open the ropes as he steps in between the rings. Uh, they played this very well as they were a married couple, but his opponent, the current TV champion, the Renegade, managed by Jimmy the Mouth of South Heart, the WCW's answer to the Ultimate Warrior if the Ultimate Warrior didn't take steroids or 
anything like that and actually had a little bit of talent. Page jumps Renegade from behind, throws some back elbows into him in the corner. Irish whips him in. Renegade would back feet out, which would let Page set up for a beautiful side rush and leg sweep, taking Renegade down. Later on in the match, Renegade has Page in the corner as he's sizing him up for what turns out to be a very beautiful back handspring into an elbow, uh, gets up on the turnbuckle. He gets ready to take flight. Of course, comes down on Page, hits him with the double axe handle, which would lead to a pin attempt. And later on, we get ready to take it home. Page is Irish whipping Renegade into the ropes. Max Muscle climbs up. Page, he collides with Renegade. Power slam, no. Renegade goes up. He's going upstairs again to the high rent district. But instead of going after Page, he, he dives down, takes out Max Muscle. He gets back in the ring. Now it's time to go home. Max Muscle grabs Renegade's ankle. Page hits the diamond cutter. One, two, three. The winner, new television champion, Diamond Dallas Page. He leaves with Max Muscle and the Diamond Doll. Tony and Bobby discuss the upcoming WCW World Tag Team title match on the line, but they go into detail more about the relationship, the burgeoning relationship between Colonel Parker and Sister Sherry. Parker manages Bunkhouse Buck and Dirty Dick Slater, the current tag champs. Sister Sherry, of course, manages the Harlem Heat. And at one point, Bobby really throws Tony by asking him this question. But aren't they going to have beautiful kids? And Tony Schiavone played it off like a pro. Let's go. Down to the ring for the tag team title match between the Harlem Heat and the champions Bunkhouse Buck and Dirty Dick Slater. So here we are, ring announcer David Pinzer bringing the challengers in first. The Harlem Heat, Stevie Ray, Booker Huffman, real life brothers. Yes, folks, build from Harlem, actually from Houston. You all know the story with Sister Sherry Martell, who is probably one of the most underrated managers, I would say, in the history of professional wrestling. A wonderful psychology, and she actually did a great job with the Harlem Heat when they were first, you know, making their mark in WCW. She says the belts are coming home to mama, and the these two were just physical specimens. Uh, I loved watching them work. Here come the champions who I do not care for as much. Nearly. Uh, Bunkhouse Buck, Dirty Dick Slater with Colonel Rob Parker. Now remember in the background you've got him and Sister Sherry involved in this situation ship. Almost I guess by today's terms it would be an entanglement. But yeah, these two gimmicks are definitely creatures of a bygone era in wrestling. Even at this point in 95. Slater, Buck, and Parker continue to make their way to the ring. These two are just ugly. Uh, Slater, though, he likes to, uh, you know, mean mug. Buck smiles for the camera. You see the champions and challengers squaring off in the middle of the ring. We get Nick Patrick showing off the gold here. Start out little circle. Dick Slater and Booker T working. Gets Booker back into the corner. You know, you think he's going to give a clean break. Of course not. He's a heel. So that works in to this. Reversal. Big clothesline. Down goes Slater regroups Stevie Ray tagged in by Booker T they tie up drop toe hold by Slater into a front face lock Booker back in work in the arm of Slater stretches out though over to the corner tags Stevie back in of course at this point Stevie comes in big kick back shot big body slam coming up by Stevie Ray onto Slater watch the impact of this one here body slams aren't a big move but boom that one did Booker worked back against the ropes by Slater as Buck gets a blind tag in here to dirt from Dirty Dick. He makes his way into the ring, takes control over Booker as they do a little double team after he chokes him from the outside of the ring of the ropes. So Buck comes in, big elbow to the back of the head. Slater tagged back in, tosses Booker out. He flies through the middle ropes, then hits his back on the steel stairs. He's hurting. Slater goes out, delivers a shot to Booker's face. They work back in. Uh, big, big side rush and leg sweep by Slater. Two count, no kick out. Champions aren't going to get over that easy, folks. Big pile driver by Dirty Dick Slater, though. And uh, that results in another two count and a kick out. But here we go. Bunkhouse Buck tosses Booker out. Slater on the outside. Going to work over one of the challengers a little bit. Tosses him right head first into the guardrail. Reverse chin lock by Bunkhouse Buck onto Booker T, which gets reversed as he picks Buck up back into the corner. Booker sets him up for one of his patented corner moves. He's going to go for a flip or a high kick, comes in and eats dirt, flies, lands on his head, Slater back in, big back body drop though onto Booker T, little stall at the top. He goes down as Stevie Ray's being admonished. Little double team action here by the champions, Buck and Slater, double Irish whip, K 
kick to the gut. Booker reverses, though. He's got a hold of Bunkhouse Buck and goes to pick him up. But Buck reverses the DDT into a body slam. Slater back in. And doesn't he look like Don Morocco? Hits Booker with a little shake, rattle, and roll here. Side neck breaker into a Boston Crab. That, though, will be broken up by Stevie Ray. Comes in, kick to the side of the head, drops Slater. Buck in. He grabs Booker T. Irish whips him right into the ropes. Turn around, axe kick to the back of Buck's head. Hot tag. Stevie Ray is going to make his way in. Clean house a bit here. Takes out Buck. Takes out Slater. Back to Buck. Picks Dick Slater up. Gets ready to deliver a big body slam onto him. Up and down. Buck stumbling around. He catches a big slam from Stevie Ray as well. Slater, though, comes over. He gets jacked in the head. Buck gets tossed. Irish whip, though, into the ropes. Stevie's waiting for him. Big body slam. Goes two count. Broke up by Slater. Booker T making his way into the ring. And at this point, it's kind of a melee. Patrick having trouble controlling everyone who's involved in the match. Bunkhouse Buck, I rake. He gets ready. Tosses Stevie Ray through the center ropes. He's out of the ring. Out of sight, out of mind, right? Kicks him right in the gut. Knocks him off the apron. Slater and Buck have got Booker T set up here for a double Irish whip move. They whip him off the ropes. Come back. Double punch right to the head. Drops Booker T. Stevie Ray's getting back into the ring, though, as he's going to break up a near fall account. Knocks Slater down. Buck's pinfalls broke up. And now we've got a schmoz. But we look on the other side of the ring, and there's Parker and <laughs> Sherry. as She's on all fours. Yeah, uh, this is very, very mid-'90s as we see Sherry. <laughs> yeah, well, that picture speaks a thousand words. But the Nasty Boys make their way in. They are going to attack uh, the tag team champions as they have a score to settle with them. And boot to the head from Sags. Pinfall. Patrick's out of position, though. Doesn't see it. Doesn't see it. Turns around. One, two, three. New tag team champions. Here are your winners. Booker T, Stevie Ray, the Harlem Heat, represented by Sister Sherry. She's still getting her swerve on in the other ring with Colonel Parker in. Both teams take uh, exception to their managers fraternizing in this way, especially during and after the tag team title match where the belts change hands. Booker can't believe it. You know, Stevie can't believe it. But they are your new WCW Tag Team Champions of the World. Post-match, we meet up with Mean Gene, Bunkhouse Buck, and Colonel Robert Parker, soon to be joined by Dirty Dick Slater. And Buck is admonishing Parker for his actions during the match while Slater just sits back and cries. Parker explains to them that he's got a plan. He's the best promoter. Mean Gene questions him. He sends the boys to the back. He says something happens to him. He fell in love with that woman. He feels like he's 20 years old. Feels like a kid again. And they'll get another shot at the gold. And then Mean Gene lays this down. Robert Parker, 20 years old. And I thought I was older than him all along. That's too Halloween Havoc promo coming up in October on Detroit. Yeah, watch for that on VHS. Shivani and Heenan break down the feud between Arn Anderson and Ric Flair, which has been growing for weeks and weeks now. The dissension in the ranks, you know, Arn never getting a world title shot against Ric Flair. You know, Mean Gene is standing by with Arn Anderson, and then they run through the video package of a bunch of confrontations where Arn either had Ric's back or they were nose to nose. You know, as like I said, the the dissension had been growing between these two, going to a boiling point, which was set to spill over. We saw Arn attack Flair in the first Nitro, and this would carry on. This is the blow-off match for this feud. Iron vs. Rick, battle of best friends. Let's go. Here we are, semi-main event of Fall Brawl 95. Arn Anderson versus Rick Flair. Arn making his way to the ring first. The enforcer of the Four Horsemen. Longtime friend of Rick Flair. Road buddy. Basically his brother in arms. Arn looks determined, looks like he's ready to bust some heads. We see some double A signs in the crowd. And then it's time for the man, the nature boy, Ric Flair, to make his entrance. He makes his way to the ring. He does his normal entrance, but a much more serious expression on Rick's face as he knows he is in for the fight of his life against Arn Anderson. I love that sign. If God was a wrestler, his name would be Ric Flair. Flair makes his way into the ring, stares Arn down. Arn, of course, not backing down, returns the flate, 
returns the favor <laughs> against Flair, as it were. And we see Brian Pillman, the American Males, Colonel Parker, Big Bubba, and then, of course, Eddie Guerrero, Alex Wright, all seated at ringside for this match. Michael Buffer with the announcement. Here we go. The two friends, longtime friends, squaring off nose to nose. Just the way these two warmed up before the match gave it that big fight feel. Just the stares, you know, the, uh, the, the preening, as it were, by Flair. Arn, you know, playing the tough guy role as he did throughout his whole career. Well, there they go. They square off, circle around. Here we go. Flair, of course, ducks under. He's got to do the strut first. And Bobby Heenan says, I don't see anyone from Hogan's team. Tony replies, well, they've all got war games. We get right back to the action. They circle, little collar and elbow tie up. Rick takes Arn in a side headlock. We're gonna get an Irish whip, drop down. Flair drops Arn with a shoulder block, comes back, Arn with a drop toe hold, paint brushes him, throws a woo to the crowd, pulling Flair's move in North Carolina. The crowd woos back, little stare down action between the two of them, as Flair doesn't appreciate that. They tie up again. Of course, Arn right back to the headlock. We get an Irish whip. Flair throws Arn into the ropes. Arn comes back. Drops Flair with a shoulder tackle. Flair pushed backwards. He bumps again. Arn then, yep, that's right. Paint brushes Flair, smacks him in the face. Flair goes down, bumps, rolls out powders. He's going to take some time. Jaw jack with the crowd a little bit. And vintage Ric Flair style, slowly making his way back into the ring. Measures up Anderson. You know, Flair spares no attention to detail. So Flair's got the arm bar on Arn. Arn reverses it, flips Flair over, Flair bumps, Arn goes to work in that arm, drops a knee, throws a couple stomps in, Flair backs off, obviously in pain from that, and more his pride hurt than anything else at this point, but comes back, Arn paint brushes Flair, Flair back bumps, gets across the ring, puts the Dukes up, Arn gives that nice little mean mug to the hard cam, Flair is livid at this point, so we go right back to the action, Flair gets in a hammer lock, works his way out of it, throws a front face lock onto Arn. The two grapple a little bit. Arn goes right back to working that arm. That is the trademark of Arn and Ole. Working the arm, hammer lock down, Rick face down on the mat. The referee asking him if he submits. Arn really, you can see, really going to work with that top wrist lock into an arm bar. Arn drops to his back, maintains the wrist lock though, pulls it into a full on arm bar, drops Flair down into it couple pin attempts nothing Arn goes upstairs the high rent district as it were and flair catches him Arn locks in a sleeper hold flair backs him into the corner Arn goes back upstairs though and drops a knee right into nature boy's back takes him down face first anderson going right back to work on that arm gets ready locks in a hammer lock into the hammer lock body slam right on the arm flair in pain Arn, at this point, he's going to try some pin attempts. He goes for one, gets a kick out at two. Another one, kick out at one. Another one, kick out at one. And a fourth one, kick out at one. Flair brings Arn back to his feet, works his way back up. And a little choppy choppy here. And a little more choppy choppy there. And then Arn pulls Flair down by the back of his head, by the hair, puts him on his back, and works outside the ring. Arm against the ring post, not once but twice. Flair in a lot of pain, comes back in. Arn gets him in position for that front face drop, arm, arm ringer slam, works Flair into the corner, gets ready for the Irish whip on Flair here. Now this is vintage Ric Flair, watch. Okay, chop. Arn's going to reverse this, takes it out on Flair, then Iris whips Flair into the opposite corner. Flair does his roll over the top rope spot onto the apron. Ducks down. Arn dives. He eats shit on the floor. He is out. Arn is out. Gives Flair a chance to recover a little bit. Flair comes out to the floor. Double axe handle off the top rope. Takes Arn. Gets him against the guardrail. You guys know what time it is. Time for a little choppy choppy. Here we go. Bang. Rick comes back. Straight right to the jaw. Arn is wobbled. Flair brings him back in. Ropes him. Drops his neck over the ropes. Arn is down. Flair is putting the boots to him. Putting the boots to Arn. Referee Randy Anderson administering the count. Flair ignores it. Flair sizes Anderson up from the corner. Comes out running. Knee drop right to Arn's head. Arn is worked back up to his feet by Flair. Flair's taking Arn into the corner. And Arn reverses it again. Punches, punches. Irish whip, big back body drop. Flair's had enough. Asks Arn for mercy, of which he shall find none. Arn goes to throw a left. Gets blocked by Randy Anderson. Eats a punch right to the gut. Flair 
When asked by the referee if he did it, Flair, of course, shakes his head emphatically. No! So Flair works back to his feet. He's going to go back on the offensive against Anderson here, who gets dumped outside of the ring again. And Flair takes this opportunity to go out, it, dole out some more punishment to Anderson. And, of course, choppy, choppy, down goes Arn. Uh, works back to his feet. Flair gets creates some distance between them. Goes running at Arn, and, of course, this backfires into the, the back body drop spot. So Arn mounts him, drops some punches on Flair's head. You know, the two get up. Uh, Arn goes for a suplex on the floor, but Nature Boy has the fortitude to block it and make Arn take the big spot on the floor with the suplex, gets back into the ring. This is going to work into a great stalling suplex by Flair. And wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Down goes Arn. The two men are laid out. They're extremely tired at this point. It's been a hell of a grueling match. Arn's got in the corner by Flair, and we're getting ready for another spot. Sunset flip by Anderson. Flair goes to punch him in the head, misses. Arn whips Flair in. Top rope spot again. He rolls up and over, but this time he's caught in the tree of woe. Arn knows it. You know what that means. It's time for some double-A punishment. Boots, boots, choke, and he calls for the DDT. That's it. We're going to go home. Notice Flair's got a hold of the rope. Arn gets it locked in, sizes it up. Goes down, and Flair holds the rope. The dirtiest player in the game. He's then just steps back and bumps for no reason. Flair goes up top, which, you know, he's done a couple times, and you know what they say about going to the well too much. Arn catches him in it, presses him out to the middle of the ring, and Arn's going up top now. Arn says, all right, I'm going to do this. Whatever you can do, I can do better. Goes jumping off at Flair for axe handle, catches a light punch to the face. Flair locks in the figure four. Arn blocks it, though. He's got that arm up, grabbing Flair's ankle, holding it as long as he can, and until Flair gets it locked in, starts punching Arn in the leg, and eventually, though, Arn will reverse this, and you can see the pressure on right there. There it is right there. He's trying to roll Flair over, reverse the hold on him, and Flair gets him up, chop locks the knee down again, says, that's it. This time it's over. He goes to lock it in. Arn, though, counters with a small package. One, two, no. And the two are back to their feet. Brawling, going back and forth again. And again, Pillman. Brian Pillman comes out of nowhere. He's on the apron. Takes him a minute to get Flair's attention. When Flair turns around, he kind of blows him off because he doesn't really know what Pillman's doing there. And Pillman decks Flair right in the jaw. And the Nature Boy is rocked. But he comes back, punches Pillman. Pillman drops down, recovers, kicks Flair in the back of the head. Meantime, Arn's getting back up. Locks in the DDT. And you know it's all mathematical at this point. Good night, Irene. One, two, three. Here is your winner, Arn Anderson. Bragging rights over Ric Flair. Solo victory in Horseman Country, Asheville, North Carolina. Arn Anderson, your winner. While Bobby Heenan cries about Ric Flair's loss to Arn Anderson, we go to the promo leading up to the War Games match, and I'm not going to cover that whole thing because it's a mess. Backstage, Mean Gene Okerlund is joined by Team Hulkamania, Hulk Hogan, Sting, Macho Man, Lex Luger, and their manager, Jimmy Hart. And it's a typical 90s promo, a lot of yelling, a lot of screaming, a lot of gesturing, a lot of postulating. And of course, you know, we get Hogan comes back with Hart because he's got to have the last word no matter what. Gene Okerlund goes over some final details, tosses it out to the arena floor where Tony and Bobby are getting ready, watching the cage go down, lower over the ring. The pyro goes off, and we're ready for War Games. If you look on screen quickly, you will find all the rules for the War Games match. Let's send it to Buffer. Finally, it's time for the main event here at Fall Brawl 95, War Games, and this is the War Games match. Michael Buffer first announces Team Dungeon of Doom. Yes, the cadre of misfits led by the Zodiac, Shark, Kamala, the man they call Ming, and of course, the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan. I love this shot of them just standing around outside the ring. You know the guys are just bullshitting right here, right? You know that. Kevin Sullivan, of course, talking about Hulk Hogan. Then we cut back to the entryway, the ramp, the, the big screen, and see the logo for Fall Brawl. Here comes Team Hulkamania, Macho Man, Sting, Lex Luger, and Hulk Hogan. Of course, Hogan marches to the beat of his own drum. Him and Jimmy Hart come out. And I love how, you know, it's all American. Jimmy Hart should never wear sleeveless shirts ever again. Uh, ever. I don't even know if he's still alive. But here's the combatants outside the cage before the match starts. Macho Man looking intense. And we're going to get this match underway here with Sting and Shark 
going at it first. Shark, of course, goes right on the offensive against Sting. He leads the way. Gets his big man offense in in the corner. Punch stomp. Sting actually gets Shark up. Body slams him. But you remember what I said, kids, about going to the well one too many times. Well, Sting does. It backfires. And Shark collapses on him. But there's no pinfalls. So he chucks Sting across the rings. He lands on the, the big fat belly. Ah, ah, ah. Sting jumps at Shark. Shark catches him in a big bear hug, though. And uh, Sting crotches Shark on the ropes. And the uh, the big nuts get, uh, you know, bounced around a little bit. Sting locks in the scorpion death lock. But just in time for the booty man. Kicks off the ceiling. Shark comes in, bails him out, though. As Zodiac grabs Sting's legs, Shark drops a big elbow. Hulk on the outside going, what's the deal, bro? What's the deal? Thought you were thought you were the man they call Sting. Everybody pacing around. Jimmy Hart waving the flag. Double team offense. Sting comes back. Tries to clothesline both of them. Uh, drops Zodiac. And in comes Macho Man. So now we're at two on two. Macho Man comes in. House of Fire. Beating the hell out of both of them until he gets kind of cut off by Shark. And they double team him. As Sting is still down on the other side of the ring. But... Sting gets up, goes after Zodiac. I want to call, I keep calling him Booty Man because literally I just do for some reason. I don't even know why. He's not even been the Booty Man yet. Oh, yeah, Kamala's in now. Uh, <laughs> Savage has uh, one of the idiots in the corner and gets cut off. Oh, yeah, Zodiac gets cut off by Shark. We're down to nine seconds. Kamala and the two fat guys are double teaming Sting. Here comes Luger. Uh, Lex Luger's going to come in. Remember, there's tension between him and Miles, but, uh, you know, uh, Brutus or Zodiac takes his beatings too. Here's a nice little double team. Macho Man and Luger, uh, Zodiac into the cage. Macho comes flying off the second rope. There wasn't much room for any kind of aerial attacks in this match. Hit Shark with a double axe handle, and he just goes down because he's tired. Uh, right here, Luger going to clothesline Zodiac. 12 seconds left. Hits Savage. Drops him, Luger, to the corner. But while they're fighting, the man they call Ming comes in. And Ming is a house of fire. Hits Sting. Hits Savage. And you're going to get to see a great kick from uh, Ming to Luger here. As he drops everybody. Headbutt. And here's a big kick to Luger. We got 20 seconds remaining. The action spread across both cages at this point. And get ready for it because the Hulkster, Hulk, Hulk Hogan... Hulkamania is going to run wild here as Hogan enters the ring. And he's you think he's going to come in and do some babyface stuff, right? Well, hits Ming with the powder. That's right. Straight heel tactic. Guess who he hits next? Hits Kamala with the powder in the face. Uh, number two. And number three, hits poor fucking Zodiac, who's got his ass beat. This punch, punch on Shark. Goes back to Kamala and working him over, working him over. Uh, back here's poor booty man again or jesus i did it again uh zodiac between the ropes chop back punch back punch back punch back boing 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 and then he bites his forehead and while he's doing that sting hits kamala with some more powder and luger comes in double axe handle to kamala's back so luger's got the double axe handle to the back on kamala hogan here we go right back to zodiac again and zodiac meets the cage of course for like the umpteenth time this match hogan locks in a very very poor looking camel clutch and the zodiac can take no more he taps out hogan team hulkamania wins doug dillinger head of wcw security escorting kevin sullivan to the ring as hogan gets five minutes with sullivan now to basically beat the hell out of him referee randy anderson helps and this is a really funny shot right here as we see sting crossing paths as he's dragging sullivan with ming and <laughs> and zodiac and ming throws a kick at him Sting throws Taskmaster right into the ring where Hulk's waiting. Hulk grabs Taskmaster, and we're going to go around the cage here as he just bounces his face off the cage. I don't know how he didn't get color here. Uh, Sullivan somehow escapes the cage. Uh, referee Nick Patrick didn't lock the door. He gets the outside, eats shit on the floor, eats the side of the cage. Hogan throws him back in. Sullivan's doing the flare. No! No more! No more! Well, Hogan wraps the tape around his neck, getting ready to throw him into the cage. Yes, Throw him into the cage. Once again, nope, big boot. Drops him. Here comes the giant as they cut away to the entry. And you can tell he's a man on a mission. He eats the referee off the stairs like he's a rag doll. Jumps over the rope. Grabs the top of the cage over both sets of ropes. And lands flat-footed. What an athlete he was at the very beginning before he put all that weight on. Hands around Hogan's neck. Hogan gets a couple punches in here. 
thinks it's going to do something. Giant chokes him out. Got it by the neck. And this is a scary move. Here we go. It basically looks like he broke his neck, and Team Hulkamania comes in, checking on Hulk. They call for a doctor down to the ring, Jimmy Hart pleading for medical assistance, and that's where the pay-per-view ends. Hulk laid out, getting medical attention. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Fall Brawl 1995. I'll give you my final thoughts here in just a second, but overall, not a bad show. Let's talk about it. Final thoughts, Fall Brawl 95. Not a terrible pay-per-view. Pillman versus Johnny B. Bad in the opening should have main evented any other pay-per-view it was on that didn't have a world title match. But as a pay-per-view match, this was either semi-main or main event quality, hands down, uh, easily a four-star match. Craig Pittman versus Cobra, throwaway match of no substance, uh, no build, jobbers, you know, Jeff Farmer, a.k.a. Cobra, would go on to be NWO Sting later on. TV title match, DDP versus the Renegade. Not a bad match. Not a great match. DDP wins the TV title. Renegade would eventually go on to kill himself. World Tag Team title match. Harlem Heat challenged Bunkhouse Buck, Dirty Dick Slater. Uh, solid tag team match. Interference at the end in true WCW style, which is these shows and pay-per-view reviews progress. You'll see what I mean. WCW always had a thing for the four-letter four letter F word finish. Uh, Art Anderson, Ric Flair... Uh, timeless classic could have been the main event on this show uh, but you know hulkamania the war games match really took precedence the dual steel cages you can't put that as semi-main i would say arn and rick kind of took the limelight from the war games match a little bit given how much of a schmaz the war games match was and the dungeon of doom at this point is pretty passe for me. I was never a big fan of that stable. Uh, kind of like the land of misfit toys is what it really reminded me of where the has-beens go. Uh, Team Hulkamania, though, a lot of star power there. Uh, the Kevin Sullivan-Hulk Hogan feud I never really got into. I was never that big of a Kevin Sullivan. Seeing Team Hulkamania win was nice, but you get the giant coming in at the end to kind of bail Sullivan out. The big as they call it the next night of nature, a choke, which was more like a, hey, I'm going to snap your neck in any other martial arts movie. Hulk Hogan's dead. Uh, and, you know, he comes back with the neck brace, dressed in all black as, as Dark Hulk Hogan, which was a precursor to the NWO Hollywood Hogan that we would come to know and love when the NWO made their debut in 1996 at Bash the Beach. We're a ways away from that, though, folks. Overall, I would give this pay-per-view out of five stars. I'm going to probably go with about three stars because of the first and the semi-main. Uh, Pillman and Bad and Arn and Rick really carried this pay-per-view. Tag match was solid. War Games match wasn't horrible, but wasn't the best. So, yeah, three stars out of five for me. We say a proper thank you to channel members at the end of the video. I'm Etep Okuyan of The Place to Be Reviews. I've been here with all of you. If I don't see you, have a great day, a pleasant tomorrow. I'll catch you on the next one. And remember. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot to tell you. Uh, do you want to send us stuff? Because this is how you send us stuff. We have a P.O. Box now. That's right. P.O. Box 924, Prudenville, Michigan 48657. If you have anything you'd like to send in to the place to be reviews, that's where it goes. And that's where your packages will be coming from as well when I ship things out to you, my Kazooians. I could do this all.